Okay, you guys. So awesome. We're getting getting nearer and nearer, uh, approaching the awesome uh, our awesome trip. So um, we're gonna have a little bit of break in our topic stuff today, and uh, the great Dr. Thomas Roy Huggins has joined us from the illustrious University of California, Los Angeles. So we're gonna do introductions in a second. But um, uh, as I said before, um, we ha I have a lot of help with Dr. Patch and Dr. Huggins and Dr. Lambrinos teaching this class. So all of these folks are your instructors. They all have a lot of great stuff to teach you about, about things. Um, and, uh, and even though we come from different campuses and different schools, we're all one big happy family. So um, with that, that said, I've known Tom for a long time. I've known, so Tom is one of my best friends. I've known him for maybe 25 years. I guess we met in 1990 like or, or 92, 92 something somewhere. Like that. Anyway, so we've known each other for a long time. And uh, so, yes. So it's like, it's like uh, family with us. So, so we might say funny things to each other. Um, uh, so Tom uh, has a background in the arts. Tom is an artsy guy, as you can tell by his uh, open chest and his, <laughs> and his wavy hair and all that kind of good stuff. Um, Tom uh, always liked to do botanical stuff, grew orchids, all kinds of neat stuff. You'll hear all about his story. Um, long story short, we had a little writer strike thing back in the day when, when people were supposed to go on strike. Now, when you're a writer, you're supposed to go on strike, but nobody goes on strike. People just say they go on strike and they actually write. Except for Tom, who actually truly went on strike. Yeah, so, I hate writing. It's, so, <laughs> this is an odd, a beautiful excuse to have fun. Have fun. So his version of fun was to go back and take some classes and things like that. So he went back, decided he really liked biology and went back and essentially uh, got his graduate degree, he got his PhD from UCLA doing a whole variety of things. Ultimately, he settled on working on a little vetch, a little uh, uh, plant in the pea family. And he looked at that in the desert. He can tell you, well, actually, no, what am I saying? No, 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 no. Oh, yeah, that was so my post. Then you worked on the vetch. First, yeah. first worked he worked on, on a thing called Laria tridentata, which is a desert uh, creosote bush, really cool plant. Has all kinds of cool interactions with insects and stuff. So Tom is an expert on all manner of things. But most recently, he runs the herbarium at UCLA. And so some of you guys don't know what an herbarium is. Herbarium is basically a museum for plants, a library for plants. And so, um, so uh, Tom has brought some of those. We'll talk about those today. Um, and what, what uh, I'll let him do to finish his introduction. But uh, basically, Tom is our lead guy when it comes to plants, right? So Tom has been working the last couple years with us to properly catalog the vegetation that we have in our restoration site. And uh, while we're interested in all plants, we're really particularly interested in woody plants. So these are plants that have stems, trees, shrubs, things like that. And um, it, it's, it's, uh, it's very easy to forget how, or, or to not realize how good we have it, or we are. It's very, it's very, very common, right? And so one of the things is here in California, we're massively blessed by uh, one of the places in the world that is best described when it comes to its critters, plants, animals. And we sometimes tend to think everybody knows about, there's, there's volumes about everybody's plants around the world. No. Almost everywhere around the world that we go, we don't have a good list of the biodiversity that is there. And this is the case in Louisiana. You'd think Louisiana, right, as we talked about previously, you know, great history, um, at least with, in terms of modern history, at least hundreds of years. So we totally must know what all these plants are. No, no. We don't have a good um, single resource we can go to and say, oh, look, here's all the plants that are in this area. Like we do in California with the, have you guys ever heard of the Jepson, the Jepson Manual? Yeah, a, a great resource. So, so essentially Tom is helping us build that for our part of Louisiana. So people have done this before, but nobody's really done this to the extent that we're doing, and especially with the conservation uh, uh, interest and application that we've been working on. So, um, so I'll let Tom talk about what he's going to talk about, but basically this is our first introduction. They don't know anything about our, our 
veg work about our, our swamp stuff. Oh, they don't know. Cool. About history. All right, great. So with that uh, introduction. Uh, Okay, so uh, Sean gave you an introduction of what I've sort of been working on for, I've worked on, uh, uh, and I, I sort of, when we Skyped, I sort of explained to you that I'm sort of into orchids, I'm working on a paper, I have been for 20 years, oh, yeah. <laughs> on a flora of a little island in the Lesser Antilles called Nevis. Um, worked on an endangered species in the Mojave Desert, the Lane Mountain Milk Vetch for, for four or five years, and got a lot, published one paper, and I've got a bunch that were waiting for there to be rain. We need some rain so we can do a proper um, population density. And um, then this. I didn't know anything about trees really until I went on this, <laughs> until, I went, until Sean invited me to the class. So everything I know about trees, I learned in this class and I'm gonna teach you guys. Um, so I have a little presentation here should I just begin? Go for it. I can see people. <laughs> okay, so today, as it says up on that thing, I'm going to be talking about the English Turn Forests, their composition and significance in post Katrina. So, New also, Orleans. are you going to talk about English Turn, or should I talk about English Turn? Oh, no, I'm going to talk about English okay. Turn. I'll okay, explain okay, okay, English okay, good. Turn. Okay, good. Good, good. I think. And so, but, but just as a reference, up is the city of New Orleans. Go ahead. So if you, t it, listen, if you have any, if you want to interrupt me, just, just go ahead. I give you permission. Thank you. Here's beautiful Louisiana. Right there is New Orleans. That is Shreveport. That's where my wife Charlotte is from. And that little elbow in the Mississippi down there is uh, English Churn. Here's New Orleans with Pontchartrain to the north, Lake Bourne to the, to the, on the right side to the east. And you can see the Mississippi snaking through the city. That big curve is English Turn. Now English Turn has some really nice large fragments of bottomland hardwood forest. The rest of the forests in New Orleans are largely gone and are continuing to disappear. For example, this is last August. It's almost a square kilometer of forest cleared for, oh, it's not running. There you go. Okay, this is, I, I discovered this in last August. It's almost a square kilometer of forest cleared for development. That it, and and this, these kind of clearings of forests are definitely not good for New Orleans, and you guys probably know why. These forests provide a number of East Coast system services, one of, the, one of which is the ability to buffer New Orleans from the effects of hurricanes, both winds and surge. As you probably know, sea level and the frequency of hurricanes are projected to rise significantly this century. So, so just, to, just to reiterate, what we're calling bottomland hardwood forest. You can also call swamp, right? As I mentioned last time, uh, a wooded wetland, a wetland, an area partly wet, partly dry over the year. Wooded wetland, we call a swamp. A wetland dominated by herbaceous plants, so non-woody things, we call that a marsh. So they're all different types of, of wetland. So, okay, there we go. So here's John Lambrinos, who'd be one of your instructors, standing in two feet of water in an English turn forest. And that's really the beauty of these forests. They act like big sponges that soak up flood water that normally go into canals and populated areas. And we're always ready for everything, I would note. So we always carry the proper rain gear. Yes, well. now this is a special thing that I like to call tr trash bag technologies. <laughs> where <laughs> we can construct almost anything out of trash bags and duct tape. And one of these, these are one of my raincoats, okay? It's not it's super good. It's raining the whole time. I checked the weather. There we go. Uh, yeah, yeah it, can, it can rain a lot. Awesome. <laughs> when it rains in New Orleans, which it does a lot, these forests hold rainwater and slowly release it over the course of day, days, which reduces the intensity of flooding. These are CSUCI students last year marking forest quadrats in the flooded forest. If it doesn't rain, this forest would be dry in three or four days. So it slowly lets all that rainwater that's accumulated that releases it slowly. Um, here's another. And not only do these forests contribute to flood protection, they're beautiful places that harbor and sustain wildlife, including tens of thousands of migrating birds like this hooded warbler banded at Delacro, and Delacro is one of the reserves you're going to be working at. 
But despite this beauty and diversity and the worsening situation vis-a-vis -vis rising sea levels and increased hurricane frequency, bottomland hardwood forests are still being cleared. This is a paper published in 2002 by White and Skojak. In it, they do floristic surveys of seven of the most intact, pristine hardwood forest fragments left in the New Orleans area. And some of these guys might not know what floristic, oh, floristic survey means. A floristic survey is one in which you do the, you, you uh, catalog the forest and determine what the frequency and distribution of the trees in that forest is. Like a census. Yeah, like a census. Here, uh, here is, here's a better picture of that map that was on the previous page. The letters correspond to forest. A is airline, H is hermit, and we got Jackson, Lafitte, Oak, Sauvage, which is the Bio-Sauvage National Wildlife Refuge, and Verit. Uh, here's English Tern right here. <coughs> now, English Tern was not part of this paper for reasons that I'll talk about in a bit, but here, here's the sad part. Between the time White and Skojak wrote the paper, had it reviewed and published it, two of the forests, Airline and Verit, had already been cut and cleared for development. Two entire forests cut. And it looks like Sauvage was more or less destroyed by Hurricane Katrina. And here's how this happened. This is Biosauvage National Wild Wildlife Refuge on August the 16th, 2005, 13 days before Katrina made landfall on the 29th. I'm going to zoom in here. These are tree canopies, more or less continuous. This is Biosauvage on sep September 7th, eight days after the storm. The whole forest is underwater, salty water. He Here's a closer view. That's the water completely covering the, the forest. Those white marks are waves. And this is Biosauvage uh, five months later in February 2006. Here's a closer view. The forest is completely trashed. The trees are down, defoliated. And this is 2014, nine years later. You can see this huge brown spot the force is still trashed, probably as a result of <coughs> salt water flooding from Katrina. Mm -hmm. Which forest was this? This is the Biosauvage National Wildlife Refuge. Um, so, and it was one of the forests that White and Skojak senses. So, if the hurricane can come through like hurricanes do, without the flooding caused by the failure of levees, would it have been? As uh, no, I don't think it would have. What, what happened was is, uh, this, this it's, it's not just the damage to the levees. What it was is the channelization. Mm -hmm. of, there are two very um, large channels okay, that form a V. What is that? that, that comes Mr. Go. Mr. Go and another channel. And what happened was the, the Katrina pushed all this salt water up these canals. And these canals breached and went over into Mr. Go, I think. And that went into Lake Pontchartrain and turned Lake Pontchartrain salty or brackish. And that's the water that, and that was right near Bio Sauvage, where Bio Sauvage is. It's uh, sort of on the eastern, southeastern side of, of Pontchartrain. It's near, it's near what we call New Orleans East, this little pass there. So, so yeah, so sometimes it's the levees failing, sometimes it's the, just, salt. we talked about last time, salt water, but also just this huge surge network of human manipulation of the landscape that allows these impacts to be greatly magnified. Like we talked last time about the storm surge. If it was just a storm surge, that'd be bad, right? That, that could kill you and cause problems. But it, the storm surge is kind of like whoosh, and then after maybe several hours, it whooshes out, right? But when we have all these basins, when we have all these things that change the hydrology, it, it, it potentially can greatly um, exacerbate the negative impacts. So that's what's going on here. So if those other two forests had not been cleared, it wouldn't have caused this? No, 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 these are unrelated. The forest fragments are sort of spread out all over the New, Lo New Orleans area. What happened was that there are these two large canals that were built that to the, from the east that flow, that, that flow toward Lake Pontchartrain. 
and the surge picked up all this water and moved them both, moved the surge salt water up these canals, and then these canals hit um, Mr. Go. And Mr. Go is another huge canal that goes into Lake Pontchartrain. So the water, the salt water went into Mr. Go and then flowed into Lake Pontchartrain. And it's very, the place where it flowed into Lake Pontchartrain is very close to Bio Sauvage. So the other thing I'll point out real quick before we leave is I'm going to jump back a couple slides here. So, uh, so, we, so we've measured this. This is an old map. But so it used to be from kind of where we are here in New Orleans, right? This is an old map. I just want to make sure you guys understand. This is not where the land is. The land is Swiss cheese and eroded out of here. It used to be, depends on, very, very specific to where we pick. But, but last time I measured it, it was maybe about 60 miles from New Orleans to the ocean, to the Gulf of Mexico. Now, it's more like fort, to open water. Now it's more like 14 miles, not 60 miles. So all this Swiss cheesing out means that salt water and all these impacts can get farther and farther and farther in. Yeah. And this is what happened, here's what happened with, with Sauvage. The salt water went in this way and in through here and there are canals. This Mr. Go connects the, the Lake Pontchartrain with, with uh, well, there's some canal that, uh, I've forgotten the name of it, that connects Pontchartrain with the Mississippi here so that boats can get between here. And what happened is water rushed in and over, spilled over into Pontchartrain. And here's where Sauvage is. So this is where this, all this salt water from here and here and here got into the, into the you know, was completely covered, the forest there. So that's, that's what the, that's right. And this is like a lot of our conservation challenges. By Sauvage, is it some perfect idyllic place? No, right? But as we lose more and more and more and more of these ecosystems, everything becomes more and more precious, right? So losing a little bit of something in a storm surge, not that big a deal. But when we're back, when we're down to just postage stamp remnants of these things, every little bit becomes a huge loss. So that's kind of where we are now. And again, like from, Tom, from Tom's maps here, it's not as if we have a contiguous forest like we used to have that would go from horizon to horizon and, oh, we chop a couple trees and it's all good. It, we're, we're talking about the last remnants of this massive ecosystem. So um, Biosauvage was severely impacted. English turn fared better. Uh, there were many large trees left standing, and there doesn't appear to have been saltwater flooding at, at, no, at, at no English Turn. Uh, the and so the vegetation grew back relatively quickly and continues to, reco to recover, although there's some Im large impacts, especially with invasive species. Um, but the forest has been, in the past, heavily impacted by, by development. There's a, here's a golf course. There's a, a, a community, a, a little community there. There's a lot of suburban encroachment to the northeast along that edge. Uh, I'd say there's 50% of the English turn forest has been developed or degraded. The much, good, of this, much of this in the list the last couple decades. Yeah. This isn't, this isn't old, old. This isn't yeah, no, no, no. The last couple, probably the last 30 years. Yeah. Uh, the good news is that although 50% is gone, 50% is still intact. And it's intact in these more or less contiguous large patches. They're almost contiguous, um, which has some important biological significance for animal dispersal. So together, they're a relatively big chunk of forest and a good target for conservation efforts. Uh, in fact, two large patches are currently being managed as reserves. There's woodland trails and Delacro. We're trying to get a paper together, as Sean mentioned, about the floristics of these two reserves. Last year we set up some plots in Delacro, and that's what I'm going to show you right now. Here's a closer view of Delacro, and this is the location of eight 20 by 20 meter plots. And this is a list of tree species from woodlands and Delacro for which we have collected herbarium specimens. Like don't freak out. Table. You guys will be able to do it, no problem. Don't oh yes, don't out. freak out. Uh, we, we've collected 30 species in 22 genera and 17 families, but some of these are very, very rare and you're unlikely to even see them. Uh, Gladeltsia, Populus, uh, Castanea, Puma, 
These are species that we've only seen one individual of. So this is just a list of the common and the very rare species too. Actually last spring, with the help of the students, uh, we found three new species that are not yet on this list. What? List. what? Yes, students found three new species. Unbelievable. So that Good makes, job, Riley. So that makes, that makes 33 tree species in this forest so far. And this is data from the eight plots we did at Delacro. These are in order of abundance or essentially dense, density. Try, uh, it turns out that trying to characterize a forest using abundance or density can be misleading because a lot of small individuals can look like they're more important than a few really large individuals uh, that are more dominant in terms of mass or volume. So foresters have come up with another measure called importance value. Importance value is a combination of, a, of species relative density plus its relative basal area. And basal area is just the cross section at breast height of the tree. These are the importance values from Delacroix on the left, where it says Delacroix. And um, then on the right, those are the white and skojack forests. The last column on the very right side, the last column are the means from all the white and skojack forests. And they don't include Delacroix. Okay, so the bold numbers are the top three species in each forest. So Delacro differs from these other forests in some significant ways. The top two species in the White and Skojack forest, Quercus virginiana and Quercus levigata, um, I mean Saltus levigata, aren't even present in the plots of Delacro. That's that was a very very surprising thing that we discovered. Um, Acer rubrum, red maple, which you'll see in a second, is the dominant species in the plots of Delacro, but it's fifth in the white and skojack forest. And our second dominant, Taxicum disticum, uh, uh, Taxodium disticum, bald cypress, is a very tiny component of the white and skojack forest. And bald uh, cypress is a very, very majestic and huge plant that has very important culturally and economically in the region. We, and you sometimes hear these places referred to as cypress forests. So we talk about bottomland hardwood forests, also called cypress forests. So these are the classic things we I talked about last time with the big knees that um, can take being underwater for a long time, but can't be underwater 24 hours a day all year. Yeah, these are huge, majestic trees. It's probably the tallest tree. Yeah, like there. 30 meters, 40 meters tall. I mean, giant. And, and the leaves Beautiful. look a lot like sequoia, uh, if, you, if you saw the, yeah, like a pine. the needles. Yeah. And our third dom dominant at, at Delacro in our plots was Fraxins, which are the ashes. They're similar in, in, in importance value to Airline, which has now been cut down for development. So it really looks like Delacro is very different floristically from the seven forests that White and Skojak surveyed. The question is why? And I think part of the answer to that question has to do with the history of land use and hydrological modification of the English term peninsula. Let me say one quick thing before we go on. So this is this is a phenom this could be an example of a phenomenon um, that we talk about a lot in conservation called shifting baselines, right? So, oh man, the stuff was so much better when Tom and I were young. There were so many more fish and this and that. But what our baseline is was already degraded, right? My great grandpa would have saw what we saw as kids and thought, oh, this thing is messed up. So if you don't have a proper ecological frame of reference, just like if we don't have the proper social history to understand social issues, um, it, sometimes is e it sometimes is easy to grow up in a certain condition and assume that that's how things always are. That's how things always should be. That's the quote unquote natural state of things. So by doing this kind of detailed work, it helps us understand that, that things are really different, right? And, and, and so the next question is, if they're different, why are they different? And that's one of the things that we, we work on. So these like, measurements, they were in 2002 or before 2002? Before 2000. It was published in 2002, so they did the work before. And sometimes it t can take you know, a year or several years to get a paper published. But those numbers from the, like the O forest, and those are also from before 2000. Yeah, 90s, 80s, 90s. Okay, so, 
So these are the um, English turn fours today. And um, it's mature bottom line hardwood forest with more or less closed canopy between 25 and 40 meters high. But it wasn't always like that. This is a map of English turn published in 1803 <clears throat> and hanging on the wall of the historic New Orleans collection, a museum in the French Quarter with an excellent research facility. Which will be there on Friday. Oh, cool. Yeah. Oh, I'm, but I'm not going to be there. Well, but then you and I will go back after. All right, but tech, but see if you can see this map. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be in a wedding, actually, in Louisville. But uh, see if you can see this map. It's hanging on the wall there. So um, let me just reiterate. This is awesome. This is totally awesome. So were these guys ecologists making maps? No, but check this out, right? Something that was created for an unrelated purpose we can now mine for value, right? So something that was something that was created um, for one purpose can have tremendous value to those of us that are trying to get insights from the past. Now, so resources like New Orleans, which we said was one was the only was the largest town in the South that was not sacked and destroyed during the Civil War. So we have all <coughs> kinds of resources from them, and we can delve into that and, and get incredible genealogical information, incredible ecological information. This is awesome. And one of the things I'm doing after you guys come back, I'm staying for a few days with Tom and John. Uh, and one of the things I'm trying to do is build an internship opportunity for you guys. So for people that are interested in future that, um, you know, this is still being discussed. This, we're still working on it. So there's nothing to promise. But the idea is that you might be able to go back to New Orleans and intern with Katie, our, our nonprofit uh, queen, who runs these areas that, that you guys will meet, but also partly with her, partly with the historic New Orleans collection. And they have wonderful resources, but not many people do in historic environmental research. So if you guys are interested in this kind of stuff, you should, you should let me know, and this might be an opportunity for you to, to go and help with that part of the recovery of uh, the southern Louisiana. So, cool. Maps are cool. And so, um, this is a French map. As you can see, it says, I don't know, down there it says Detour d'Anglais. That's English turn in French. Um, so, uh, th this map show what this map shows is that the original vegetation of English turn was stratified with the forest along the Mississippi River that had been partially cleared and an interior which is labeled prairie, which was likely a wetland dominated by grasses, a marsh. Right. A marsh. Something like, something like this one, which is eight miles east of English Turn. Uh, this is the kind of distribution of vegetation created by levees. Levees are ridges along river banks. They, they can occur nat naturally, or they can be built to contain a river or a canal during flood stage. This is Steve Nelson. Hopefully you'll meet him. Yeah, well, he's giving us a levee tour on Friday. Explained to CSUCI students how that levee back there broke during Katrina. It, that's an artificial levee. Right, he's with, about right here, right? Yeah, right, right, back, yeah, right back there with a, with a concrete flood wall on top. This is an artificial levee built to contain the Donner Canal that drains the English Turn today. Levees can also form naturally. I'm very proud of this, this, these drawings I made of myself. <laughs> this is the initial condition, a river within its banks at low seasonal water levels. Here's the river at flood stage. And at flood stage, the heaviest, largest particles suspended in the floodwaters get deposited closest to the river and the later, smaller soil particles are deposited for far away. So after many floods, natural levees form along the river bank with soil elevation higher along the river bank and decreasing as you move away from it. So the soils at higher elevations drain toward lower elevations where water accumulates. This gradient in soil water affects plant distributions. Plants that can tolerate lots of soil water like marsh grasses, grow here. And plants that require drier conditions, like trees, grow here on the elevated levee. And this is exactly what you see represented on this 210-year-old map. Water is draining away from the Mississippi, perpendicular to the river's natural levee, accumulating in these wetlands, and then flowing south in this major bio. 
and the plants are distributed as you'd expect across the soil moisture gradient with trees on the elevated levees along the Mississippi, although they're cleared in this a little bit, and wetland grasses in the lower elevation soggy interior. These double lines appear to be drainage canals intended to drain water off of cleared areas for cultivation and habitation. You can actually see, I don't know if you can see this, it says canal, canal this something, familiar or something, right there. So these were man-made structures. And as you can see, because the land is elevated at the levee, water flows down that way into the interior. So, so let me take a quick pause here. So why is land this way? Why are all these linear features relative to the river? Yeah, right, man-made. Why? To prevent uh, flooding and maybe high... To prevent flooding, right. Um, do, you, do you have a property map one in there later? Or no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, show okay, that. Okay, okay, cool. So these double lines appear to be drainage canals intended to drain water off of cleared areas for cultivation and habitation. These same methods are still used today to drain and dry land. This area is Delacro, and above it is that suburban development. Remember, water, rainfall, flows perpendicular to the levee in this direction. Here you can see how the developers of these properties have dug a series of small canals to drain their properties into the larger canal below. Do you guys see that? Do you see those, those, those canals? They call it corrugation. Here's that larger canal. It flows into the golf course. <laughs> the water flows through the golf, golf course and then is pumped into the intracoastal canal here at this massive pumping station that can pump tens of millions of gallons of water a day. I calculated that it's about it can pump about 150 million gallons per day. And it pumps it into the Mississippi. And it pumps it into... Uh, this is the intercoastal waterway. The intercoastal waterway right there. So, th this, so this water here is lower, right? So they have to pump it up and over this uh, levee structure here. And then it dumps into here. Yeah. What this means is that all the water flowing out of the development at the upper right which would normally accumulate in the center of the peninsula is being pumped into the river. Here we are back in 1803. This is 90 years later. This is a US Geological Survey topographical map from 1892. The canals are still present, but it looks like the forest belt has been entirely cleared for cultivation. While the forest appears to be gone, the interior marsh looks like it's still present. Now here we are 40 years later. This is another USGS map from 1935. And it looks like the English turned marshes are now all gone. And here's how they did it. They built three serious canals. The Norman Canal, the really big Donner Canal, and the Planters Canal. One of our collab collaborators, which Sean has mentioned, Katie Braystead, who's, who, who runs these reserves, believes that English Turn was drained for two reasons, agriculture and yellow fever. New Orleans had been plagued by yellow fever epidemics in the 19th century. And yellow fever is transmitted by Aedes aegypti. Mosquitoes require standing water in their larval stage, and so we think that English Turn Marsh was drained in part to prevent the scourge of yellow fever. This mosquito is a kind of a metaphor for what we did to English Turn. We sucked the marsh dry. <laughs> and so in place, of, in, so in place of marsh, we now have a forest. It may not be a pristine, naturally occurring forest like the Forest White and Skojak surveyed in 2002, but the good news is that it's beautiful and it supports tons of wildlife and actually does a better job of protecting New Orleans from hurricanes than a marsh. Despite these important functions, though, the English turn forests are constantly under threat, most recently from a, a proposal to build a baseball facility. Without massive inter intervention, I'm sure you guys know now, the prognosis for New Orleans at the end of the century is grim. Saving and growing forests is a cost-effective way to protect New Orleans from the inevitable Cat 3 or 4 or 5 hurricane that spins off the Gulf of Mexico. Forests are important. 
in their own right, but especially in New Orleans. All right, now let's have some fun with plants. So can I say one quick thing? Oh, sure, sure. So speed bumps. So, so a common metaphor people use are speed bumps. And that, it, it, I mean, so Tom uses, I, you might hear Dr. Patch use this, these terms, ecosystem services. So this is a common phrase that has become popularized in the last 15 years or so. The idea is to communicate to folks that might not have a great ecological knowledge of the value of intact, healthy, well-functioning natural systems, ecological systems. Right? So just like Tom said, there is value, there's intrinsic value in this place, whether you and I ever go there, whether you and I ever chop that tree down and turn it into a chair, um, there is inherent value. But for some folks, that's hard to understand. So the notion was put forward of ecosystem services. So in other words, um, the traditional economic models say the only value of this resource is when we convert it into something you and I can consume. And that's not correct. That, that's that's, an, that's a, a sloppy way of doing valuation. So to counteract this, folks came up with uh, uh, this term ecosystem services, one of which was my old postdoc advisor. And the idea here is we actually get benefit by leaving these healthy systems as they are, we get benefit. One of the benefits we can talk about is storm protection. So as Tom was saying, um, if we had, this was all grassland, this was all a, a marshland, and the big crazy storm surge came, the wind, the swell of water, and our house was on this side of that, we wouldn't get much protection, right? It wouldn't help break up that speed of that storm. However, if we had a bunch of huge giant 30 meter trees that make a massive thicket between us and that storm, it's going to it's going to make the wind in effect much lower on the shingles of my roof. It's going to make any water that comes in it has to spill around and go around these these trees. So it still might slap up against my door, but it would probably make my door wet. It wouldn't blow my door in, right? So we talk about these forests one of the services they get us is in effect a storm protection barrier, a buffer, a natural speed bump that slows down the most intense part of these storms. So that's not to say there aren't other values too, but when we talk about ecosystem services, we can put that in a clear uh, uh, concept and attribute a clear value. So if we didn't have this, you and I would have to build a bunch of giant artificial seawalls or or flood barriers or whatever, and that costs money, right? This is free. We don't pay anybody. You know, if this is a healthy forest, we don't we don't pay anyone to garden the trees. We don't pay anyone to water the plants. It's just the natural thing. So in effect, we get a free service from nature. We get a free storm protection area from nature. And when we talk about it like that, it's maybe much easier for folks that maybe don't have a relationship with nature or don't go out of the city very much, they can see the value to their own lives of a healthy, intact ecosystem. So that's this notion of ecosystem services. Okay. One of the fun things you're going to find out at this forest, which we weren't, well, which I wasn't too, because I work in deserts and stuff like that, where stuff grows really slowly, how fast this forest grows. Yeah. So this, this plant right here, these trees right here, are probably post-Katrina. Yeah. Trees. So these large trees were pro are intact and left over from the storm. But these smaller trees, like this one and this one and this one, are probably post-Katrina. The, 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 the uh, transects that you guys are going to be cutting are probably, or that uh, Riley, Riley hacked, through. hacked through last time, are probably completely overgrown now. You can't even see where they are. So this stuff really grows terribly fast compared to, to uh, uh, stuff around here. One of our invaders, the first year we measured it, and uh, we came back the next year, and it had grown nine feet, this woody tree. <laughs> I mean, this is, this, is, this, is, this is a great plant growing place. Yeah, incredibly produ productive ecosystem. Okay, so let's look at some, let's look at some trees. This is one of the most common trees you're going to see. 
It's see if you can remember if you can kind of remember this. Going. Okay, see you. See you. Wait, Riley, before you go, do you have any advice to these guys with Ooh. for next year for the for this trip? Should they have car hearts? Ooh, definitely have car hearts. Did it rain when you were there? It, it drizzled on us okay. one day. Uh, it was very swampy in Delacro. Probably even more swampy if you guys are there in the rain. Yeah. Uh, don't go to Bourbon Street. <laughs> don't go to Bourbon Street. And have fun. It's, it's a blast. Oh boy. Why don't go to Bourbon Street? Just don't worry about it. I know it's, it sounds like forbidden fruit, like you guys want to go, but it's it's really not. It's There's way Just better places. Go there, get a beignet, and then leave. It's it, it's like a big frat house kind of thing. There's, it's not really, but apparently, I mean, I've never been there. But during during like Mardi Gras, that's oh, that's the place to go, though, right? Because there are parades. Die, right? There are parades. <laughs> and I guess I don't know. I mean, have you been there for Mardi Gras? Yeah. Watch out for water. Mocks. Wow, man. On what? Water mocks. Right before, right after. And Creoles, Cajuns. Yeah, it's super fun. Just yeah, <laughs> don't worry about it. <laughs> and what's your favorite food there? My favorite food, gumbo and cornbread. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have heard the cornbread song, right? Yes, sir. Oh boy. Okay, cornbread so cornbread. All right. All right. Thanks, Riley. See you, Riley. Bye, fun. So this is red maple. It's one of the most common, one of the most common plants there. You can see its distribution is huge on the East Coast. So if you know this plant. You can do censuses all along the eastern seaboard. So that's a good thing because some of you guys may turn into to consultants and plant consultants. People make living as, as con plant consultants. They go to places and they, they, they count the plants and do species lists. And uh, so that's a viable occupation and, you know, <laughs> et cetera. So these things have, you can see that the, the plant is basically three-lobed there and it has these soft serrations along the, the margin. Um, next is we have uh, American Elm Ulmus Americana. This is going to be lo a lot less um, a lot less common, but it, um, it, it it it's kind of an interesting plant. It has this asymmetrical base. This is the petiole. It's the stem of the leaf. It has this asymmetrical base, and then these leaf veins are called pinnate because they're radiating to the side like that. That's a pinnate. Uh, radiation. Um, you're not going to see, but it has also has a huge, huge distribution in the eastern United States. Next. This is going to be a very common one that you guys are going to see. It's box elder. Also an acer, so it's related to the maple, to the red maple. It's acer negundo. And it's, it's, it's biggest, it's the, the leaves are trifoliate. So these, this is one leaf with three leaflets on it. It's pinnately compound, they call it, with three leaflets. And they have these helicopter-like uh, seeds, if we, if we see any with seeds. You may see some on the, on the forest floor. This is an ash. Now, ashes are hard to identify, so we've lumped them. In this presentation, I have two ashes, pumpkin ash and green ash. Uh, fra they're fraxinous species. They're in the olive family, the Oleaceae. Um, you're just going to be able to identify them, if you can, as ashes. Uh, the leaves are large, they're pinnately compound, but now we have like seven leaflets instead of the three leaflets for Acer Nagunda for the box elder. Next. Here's pumpkin ash. It has much lower, look at this, uh, much more restricted distribution, but it has, here's Lake Pontchartrain. It has this little teeny bit right there where um, English turn is. Okay, next. But they're very hard to dis distinguish, so we're just lumping all the fraxinus. This is that bald cypress, which is that very, very important plant. Um, these are huge things with but buttless roots, bu uh, buttress roots. You guys are. You say buttless <laughs> roots? <laughs> oh my god! It's yeah. only the first day with them, and you're already talking about buttless roots. Uh, this is not going to be a hard one to identify. Yeah, um, wow. It's in the Cupressaceae, which is it's a gymnosperm. It's the only gymnosperm in that forest. Uh, you guys know what gymnosperms are? They're, they're cone, tr they're tr trees that don't have flowers. All the other trees have flowers. This, this one has cones. Um, and it's huge. Next. Uh, this is quer a Quercus. This is water oak, Quercus nigra. Not super common, but you guys are definitely run into it. It has these sort of spade-shaped uh, leaves, 
and these tiny little acorns, but the acorns are not going to be around. So, um, next. And this is another Quercus, another oak called Nuttles Oak, Quercus texana. It's the, the, the family is the Phagaceae. Um, this is very easy to distinguish because it has these deep lobes. The leaves have these deep lobes. And it also has this distribution, which is basically in the in the tennis in the what do they call this? The Mississippi, Mississippi River Valley. Mississippi River Valley. Next. Now these are the Everything the, boo. Uh, these nice. are the Chi this is one of the Chinese bad boys. There are three of them. A Chinese privet. And I could just I could show you this. It's growing right out there and over there. It, this grows in everyone's backyard in, in Los Angeles. It's ornamental. It's an ornamental, so they plant it everywhere. It's very hardy and a pretty plant, and the, and the flowers smell sweetly. But, um, and it's not invasive here, but in Louisiana, this thing goes ape. It's all over the place and is a terribly destructive invasive species. Um, you'll be able to tell it instantly. There's lots of it over there, and you'll, you'll get to know it fairly well. Uh, next, this is Chinese. Oh, say boo! Uh, say super boo boo! Uh, boo. Uh, Yes. Right. Oh man. This is in the Euphor Euphorbiaceae Euphor with it, which is kind of an interesting family because it has cactus-like members in Africa. But this is from China, and uh, it has these heart-shaped sort of deltoid leaves, rhombic leaves. Uh, teardrop. E e e teardrop. Yeah, easy to identify. Chinese tallow, Triadica sepifera. Probably our most problematic invader that we're trying to get rid of. In, uh, in the United States. Well, yeah, yeah, but especially in our plots, yeah. In many southern forests, this is taking over, and some people predict that total forests will be completely converted to this to the species. Next, this is the other Chinese bad boy, China berry, the uh, Malia zatarak. Now, if this is these are this is a one leaf that's compound th two or three times, so it's compound once. And then compound twice there. Also fairly easy to identify because it's so divided. The leaves are so divided. Um, Wait, do we boo China Berry? Uh, yes. Uh, nice. What I wonder is, Sean, is what we need to do is go to China and see what of our stuff has gone over there. You if know, any. I remember when I was young, I went to New Zealand, and their invasive species are California redwood. <laughs> oh, my God. And uh, and trout and our and our and our our salmonid species, yeah, rainbow trout. So it's kind of funny because <laughs> it's like, hey, this is great. I got this thing out of here, I or whatever they say. <laughs> <laughs> Next, okay, what's this, guys? Oh, maple, red maple, red maple, booyah! It's a rubrum. Next, what's this one? Oh no. no idea. American elm. Booyah! All right. It has a huge distribution. You get to know this plant. You've got a you got a good hold on many other American places. Elm. Next. What's this one? Box elder. Box elder. This Booyah! Is, this is another Acer Acer Nagundo in the Sapindaceae. Next. Green ash. Green ash. This is an ash. All right. Fraxinus Pennsylvaniana. Here's another ash. A pumpkin ash. Booyah! I'd like to see if we could actually find that one because that's a good get. Look at how tiny that distribution is. Hey, go back to the other one. Yeah, wait, what is, what's the difference between those two? That one's greener. This, this is greener. Well, there are very <laughs> subtle things associated with hairs on the petiole. Yeah, you have to rub it on your face and figure it out. I've got, a, I've got <laughs> specimens that we're going to take up to LSU to look at their herbarium to actually pull out known specimens. That's what herbariums are good for. You. People have identified the plants correctly, so you can compare them to the plant you have. Okay, next. It's pretty hard. Oh, we already said this one. What was this one? Pumpkin ash. Ah. Buttless. Buttless. Nice. See, now we're going to discard calling Oh, it buttless. says Taxodium disticum up there. i got to erase that. Yes, yes, this is bald cypress. Like we know what that is. There you go. Bald cypress. Yeah, so this is the cypress. This is the classic, you know, uh, characteristic tree of the Louisiana swamps. Yes, nice. You, you can tell. 
I don't know what you know. Niagara means black, I think. So this right. is, they're calling this black oak. Yeah, it's, it's so it's very confusing. Oaks, there, there's different fam, there's different sort of groupings of oaks, white oaks and red oaks, and it just it, and it's black all oaks. it's all black weird. Oaks. So, but you can tell it's an oak because it. I mean, this picture at least there's there's acorns. But this has it has kind of like a duck foot. Uh, <laughs> a duck leaf. foot, excellent. Yeah. It's very interesting leaves for an oak. Yeah. Why? Oaks are usually kind of lobby. Uh, a lot of the ones I've seen at least are kind of like pointy. Also, like yeah, Jay's an expert on the quercus tell. Try to be. Wait, lobby means pointy. Uh, lobby's kind of like. Uh, lobby would be like. There's a big, big sit. Sinus. It's like a huge. Si yeah, yeah. Next, next one. Lobby would. Like, I don't know. Wait, where's the? Do we have any? I'm, I'm looking. I'm looking. I'm looking. I'm looking. Yeah. Oh, and the next one. Actually, the next one. There you go. And this is a lobe. Got it. That's this is Quercus. What is one? What did you guys say? Nuttles oak. Nuttles oak. oak. This is. It should be Texas oak. This is. I think this is supposed to be also a L. I mean, this is an L, but it's, I oh, think yeah, it, that's wrong. it should be capitalized. Yeah, Nuttles. Nuttles. Nuttle was a famous naturalist Nuttle about 150 years ago. Okay, that's, I Lobo. think that's it. Oh, wait, and there's the three bad boys. That's right. Uh -oh. Which one is Do you guys remember this one? Yeah. Chinese privet. China invasive. Ligustrum sinensis. Boo. Boo. The biggest boo. Chinese tallow. Tallow, right. Tallow. Triaticus sevifera. And then here he is, China. China Berry. China Berry. Booyah. Malia. Isn't the president's daughter named Malia? Yeah. yeah. With an well, she's One got of a them. botanical One of them. What? Snap. All right. Pretty cool. <laughs> so what is it like in China? Hope so. It's interesting. So if you go to our, say, coastal bluffs, you'll see a lot of what people might call crystalline ice plant or, 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 or PCH or highway ice plant. And we'll just see it covering, covering the, the dunes, covering the area next to the freeway, covering the area next to the parking lot, that kind of stuff. If you, well, that comes from South Africa. If you go to South Africa, it never, ever, 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 ever gets like that. That is so bizarre. It's a man. plant in the midst of you know, 20 other plants. So one of the issues with invasive species is um, sometimes when they are able to get to a new place, sometimes they just, usually they just sort of chill out. And if they persist, they're just kind of there. But the ones that actually can go crazy can actually form more monocultures, more, more sort of just themselves. And they, it, it can happen for a variety of reasons. Maybe the things that eat them aren't here. Maybe the diseases that infect them aren't here. And they just can kind of ooh and go. And so um, one of the ways people try to deal with invasive species is sometimes to go get other parts of their ecosystem and release those parts into our ecosystem. So say the predator, say the disease organism, say the, the bug that, that s eats the flowers or, or something like that. And uh, that can be effective, but it's also tricky because we've also done that incorrectly and then just cause another problem. Um, but yeah, invasive species are, are, a, are a huge challenge. Cool. All right. All right. Good job, Tom. Thank you. So I think, I think we'll take, we'll, we'll turn on the light, we'll take a five minute break and then come back and we'll actually talk about some of our plant sure, pressings yeah. here.